Good morning and welcome everyone to the 80th Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS, also known as PACHA, full council meeting. My name is Marlene McNeese. My pronouns are she and her, and I am one of the co-chairs of PACHA, and I currently serve as a deputy director, assistant director at the Houston Health Department overseeing our areas of HIV, STI, and viral hepatitis prevention. For everyone in the room and those watching online through the live stream at HIV.gov, I really want to welcome you and thank you for your time and attention with us today. Before we launch into our meeting, uh, we are being hosted here at the University of Texas School of Public Health, and I want to allow uh, our distinguished dean and colleague, Dr. Eric Borwinkle, to say a few words of welcome. Uh, so I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Borwinkle. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, you did not hear or come here to hear a dean speak, so I'm going to be very brief. Um, I want to welcome you to the University of Texas School of Public Health. For those of you from outside Texas, I want to welcome you to Texas. Most importantly, um, what I want to do is say thank you. Thank you for all of your efforts to reduce new infections, to reduce um, health disparities, improve outcomes. Um, the work you do is noticed outside. The work you do is extremely impactful, um, both for patients, their families, their communities, um, and the entire country. So again, welcome to the School of Public Health, and I wish you a great meeting. I wish you a productive meeting. And again, thank you for being here. And we have so many of our uh, local friends and colleagues uh, in the room. So welcome to you all. Many of our uh, community planning group members, our Ryan White Planning Council members, just thank you for your continued advocacy and support. And you may hear from a few of them uh, before we leave our agenda over the next couple of days. Uh, as, before we get started, uh, we always like to begin with a uh, brief uh, definition of Pacha's Charter our charge and our mission. Uh, PACHA is designed to provide advice, information, and recommendations to the Secretary of Health and Human Services regarding programs, policies, and research to promote effective treatment and prevention. We also ensure that this advice uh, to the Secretary is also regarding the development and implementation of the Ending the HIV Epidemic in the U.S. Initiative, PACHA also uh, monitors the implementation of the National HIV AIDS Strategy and makes recommendations to the Secretary and to the Director of the White House Office of National AIDS Policy as appropriate concerning all of these implementation uh, progressing and uh, goals and activities. Under the authorities given in the Presidential Memorandum and Executive Order 13703, Pacha shall contribute to the federal effort to improve HIV prevention and care, and the functions of the council are solely advisory in nature. According to our charter, council members are selected from prominence in their community as leaders with particular expertise in or knowledge of matters concerning HIV AIDS, public health, global health, population health, faith, philanthropy, marketing, or business, as well as other national leaders held in high esteem from other sectors of society. Pacha selections also include persons with lived HIV experience and persons disproportionately impacted by HIV. All council members, including the council leadership, is appointed by the secretary through the office of the assistant secretary of health. And we will be hearing more from Dr. Admiral Levine in her remarks to the council on tomorrow. There have been some significant changes in the federal landscape. So I just wanted to mention a few, especially regarding federal appropriations. On March 23rd, lawmakers approved the final minibus of spending bills for fiscal year 2024. Yes, indeed. As many of you know, this closes out a protracted spending cycle marked by partisan disagreements and continuing resolutions. This spending package by and large, extends fiscal year 2023 totals for the remainder of 2024 as a result of non-defense discretionary budget caps. Also, all programs under the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Center for HIV, Hepatitis, STIs, 
and TB prevention and the Ryan White HIV AIDS programs were level funded. Yes. Ending the HIV, yes, yes. Ending the HIV epidemic initiative uh, programs were also flat funded and that was despite the House proposal to eliminate these programs. So while we have these increases in supports for continued funding, uh, our health programs remain uh, urgently uh, necessary to fund fully. So what we are hoping for is that in uh, once these fiscal year 2024 appropriations, now that they're completed, that we push and continue to strive uh, for continued success and implementation of these programs throughout the fiscal year 2025 uh, talks and discussions. Welcome to Texas, everybody. <laughs> They say everything truly is bigger in Texas. And I <laughs> definitely want to thank the idea that we have a full house in the room today. Uh, a number of you who are watching online and just I cannot say enough about my gratitude and appreciation, both for our Pacha members, our federal colleagues, our community members for joining us here this week. We believe we have some important conversations and some uh, advice and recommendations that we may be able to glean from the discussions we hear about the challenges and successes of program implementation here in Texas. So you will hear from a number of colleagues throughout the state over the course of the next two days, and we're excited about that. Uh, we started our uh, full Pacha engagement on yesterday uh, with three incredible site visits. I would be remiss to try to put it all into words, what we experienced on yesterday, but I definitely want to give my sincere thanks and appreciation to Elias Chino, Executive Director of Flots Incorporated, who started our day with a full immersion of cultural experience, and we had a mariachi band they demonstrated their profound HIV awareness work through telenovelas, uh, their partnership with the Mexican consulate here, and the testing and screening services they are providing over there. It was extraordinary. We also followed up uh, that visit with uh, a visit to Avenue 360 Health and Wellness uh, with the, under the leadership of Dr. Charlene Flash. Yes. I won't say a lot because you're going to hear directly from her today, but needless to say, her staff are on it. So we had lots of questions and we wanted to hear about both successes and challenges, and they were quite frank and forthcoming. So we really appreciate the extraordinary leadership underway uh, in serving the communities through uh, those clinical operations there. So thank you, Dr. Flash. And lastly, we capped our day. Uh, in the late afternoon with a visit to the Normal Anomaly Initiative under the leadership of Ian L. Haddock. <laughs> and I think the one takeaway for me is uh, I thank Ian for reminding us that community has the answers and they've been saving themselves for a long time without it being a named intervention. And what's really most important is us figuring out a way uh, through allyship and how we might be able to support in the work what communities can be empowered to do all on their own. So thank you, Ian. Thank you, Dr. Flash. Thank you, Elias Chino. We had a blast yesterday. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I do want to say a bit about some of the artwork that you see around the room. Uh, this is a local project uh, here in the Houston area called Art on the Streets, World AIDS Day Art Project and Award Ceremony. Uh, I believe Mr. Corey Garrett is in the room with us this morning. Is Corey here? But he is the coordinator, uh, initiator, visionary behind this project. It has eight years of implementation, and it demonstrates this collaboration between a local uh, school district, the Houston Health Department, and other community-based organizations. The artwork that you see were all created by local students, 
And there have been over 50,000, I'm sorry, excuse me, I've missed some zeros, 5 million impressions since its inception. Thank you. And much of the data that's been collected from this particular project demonstrates its impact on uh, efficacy in raising HIV AIDS awareness. And since 2019, abstracts have been submitted and they've been presented at national conferences like NATO, APHA, and NCSD. So in closing, I'd like to call out and recognize important <laughs> awareness days in March. We are in uh, the month and National Women and Girls HIV Awareness Day was on March 10th, as most of you know. National Native HIV AIDS Awareness Day on March 20th, uh, and March is also Women's History Month. So we really want to commemorate and encourage the study observation and elevation of the vital role women uh, play, not only in American history, but also in this work. Uh, in the more recent past, we have unfortunately lost two giants in the field of HIV. And so I would be remiss not to call out and recognize the tremendous impact of these two women, Ms. Idea Broadbent and Ms. Cecilia Gentili. I am also joined here today uh, by my esteemed colleague and Pacha co-chair, Dr. Vincent Guillermo Ramos. And so I will pause now and allow Vincent to give some of his opening comments. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to be fairly focused. Uh, but my name is Vincent Yamaramos. I'm one of the co-chairs, uh, again, welcoming everyone, all the Pacha members, the federal partners, and all the people that are here that represent community. Thank you for being here. Uh, two quick things I'd like to accomplish. First, I just want to build, Marlene, your comments were beautiful. And I think you captured the sentiment and spirit of yesterday in the site visits. But there were two things that I wrote down that really stood out for me personally as an individual member of Pacha. First, yesterday I saw such clarity of purpose. Boy, at each of the sites was there a deep commitment to the work. And I left feeling sort of re-energized and charged around the mission to end HIV in our country. And it was really clear during the three site visits. The second thing that emerged is that as someone who was not from Texas, I started to hear more about some of the local challenges and some of the issues and tension points that if we are as a nation to achieve the EHG, that we need to start talking about. So I'm looking forward to the meeting because over the next two days, we'll have a chance to dive a little deeper into some of that content. So with that, I'm gonna run through very quickly the agenda and just kind of highlight what we'll be doing over the next couple of days. We're starting with open, opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Uh, we'll follow that uh, after roll call with the national syphilis and congenital syphilis update from HHS. The subcommittees for PACHA will provide updates of the important work that each of the subcommittees has been undertaking. This morning, we're gonna set the stage and we'll hear from a panel that will really uh, look at sort of what's happening here in Texas and characterizing the epidemic in Texas. That will be followed by a panel this afternoon that is really looking at cisgender uh, black and Latina uh, women and issues around PrEP uh, access and utilization. And then I'm uh, especially looking forward to us thinking about uh, the Latino Hispanic community and in particular, one of our uh, visitors, Dr. Andrew Seely, who's gonna provide context on why Mexico and the US are binational partners. Why is that important? And why should we care about that historical, social, economic, uh, and cultural connection? Uh, and then we'll wrap up today uh, with some public comment. And, uh, and then tomorrow, we'll pick up again with some opening remarks. That will be followed by a great panel uh, on rural and urban issues and thinking about some of the unique characteristics of why uh, the work uh, potentially is different in those two contexts. And then as always, we'll have Pacha to the people. And at the end of the day, we'll have time for reflection and for discussion as a committee. So again, welcome and a really exciting next two days. And thank you all for being here. Thanks, Vincent. I will now turn the floor over to Ms. Kay Hayes, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Infectious Disease, Director of the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy, and Executive Director of PACHA, who will facilitate our roll call for today. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, and welcome again. It's, I'm so delighted to be here in Houston. 
Uh, before we get the roll call started, I would be remiss if I didn't say a special thank you to Marlene. Uh, I just have to say that. I will tell you from sun up till sundown, the level of thought and engagement uh, was just heartening. And so really wanted to say thank you. And thank you to all of our Houston partners that helped make this happen. Um, <clears throat> when I do this roll call, I'll state your name, but then please, when you respond, tell us where you're from, what organization or where you're from. So I just wanted to share that information with our audience that's here in the room and our virtual space. Uh, so with our Pacha roll call, Pacha co-chair Marlene McNeese. Present, Houston Health Department, right here in Houston, Texas. Pacha co-chair Vincent Guillermo Ramos. Present, I'm uh, from Washington, D.C., from the Institute for Policy Solutions at the Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing. Pacha member Guillermo Chacon. Guillermo Chacon present at the Latino Commission on AIDS, offices in North Carolina, here in Texas, in Florida, and staff uh, in the Deep South. Thank you. Thank you. Pacha member Philip Chan. Present virtually. I am here at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, and also work uh, for the Rhode Island Department of Health. Thank you. Thank you. Pacha member Tori Cooper. Present, uh, direct, she, her pronouns, Director of Community Engagement at the Human Rights Campaign, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Jordan, across the South. Thank you. Pacha member, Rania Copeland. Present, uh, based in Los Angeles, I am the founder and CEO of Equity and Impact Solutions. We're a consulting firm that works with Fortune 500 companies, with uh, government entities and social justice organizations on their efforts around equity. I'm so happy to be here um, in the Dirty South. <laughs> Thank you. Pacha member Mackenzie Copley. Present. I'm the co-founder and CEO of One Tent Health, an HIV screening organization in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Pacha member Alicia Diggs. Present. Alicia Diggs from North Carolina, Community Engagement Manager at the Centers for AIDS Research at UNC Chapel Hill. Thank you. Pacha member Jennifer Cates. Present virtually, I'm based in Washington, D.C. at KFF, where I oversee our work on global health and HIV policy. Thank you. Pacha member, Paul Kawada. Uh, present, I am the director of NMAC in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Pacha member, Duvia Lozano. Present, I am the program director of Chicanos por la Causa Latinos Unidos contra el SIDA, Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you. Pacha member, Tiomi Luckett. Present, um, pronouns she, her, and I am based in Little Rock, but I am the senior national organizer at Transgender Law Center, and I manage the program Positively Trans. Glad to be here. Thank you. Pacha member, Jesse Milan. Good morning, I'm Jesse Milan, the president and CEO at AIDS United, headquartered in Washington, D.C. We're a national organization focused on strategic grant making, capacity building, and policy and advocacy. And we just did AIDS Watch last week. <laughs> Thank you. Pacha member DeAndre Moore. Present, uh, use he, him, his pronouns. I am a resident of Beaumont, Texas, and native. Um, I am the owner and um, CEO of the Park on Calder, which is a brand new restaurant based out in Beaumont, Texas, and a board member to um, Prevention Access Campaign, which is the founding organization of U Equals U and AIDS Vaccine Advocacy Coalition. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Pacha member, Leo Moore. Present, uh, Medical Director, Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, based in Los Angeles, California. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Pacha member, Laura Platero. Pacha member, Laura Platero. Pacha member, Kayla Quimbley. Pacha member, Kayla Quimbley. Pacha member, Natalie Sanchez. Present, Natalie Sanchez from Los Angeles, California. Uh, Director, Los Angeles Family AIDS Network. Thank you. Pacha member, Patrick Sullivan. Present, I'm Patrick Sullivan. I, uh, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, where I'm in the Rollins School of Public Health, Emory University. Thank you. Pacha member, Jeff Taylor. Good morning, Jeff Taylor. He, him pronouns. 
uh, co-founder and director of the HIV and Aging Research Project, Palm Springs, California. Thank you. Pacha member, Marvell Terry. Present, based in Atlanta, Georgia, cultural organizer and activist. Thank you. Pacha member, Hansel Tooks. Present, uh, he, him pronouns. I am associate professor of medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Thank you. Pacha member, Carol Tresden. Present, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a nurse and I'm the executive director of the Association of Nurses in AIDS Care. We are a global nursing membership organization and I am based in Philadelphia. Thank you. Pacha member, Daphina Ward. Pacha member, Daphina Ward. Pacha member, Daryl Wheeler. Present. Um, good morning. My name is Daryl Wheeler. I'm in, uh, I am in New Paltz, New York where I serve as the first non-white and openly gay president of the university. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And our CDC Hearst Advisory Committee on HIV, Viral Hepatitis, and STD Prevention and Treatment, known as the CHAC, our liaison, Wendy Armstrong. Present virtually, sorry not to be there. Um, I am a professor of medicine at Emory University in Atlanta and, uh, and work also at the Grady Health System. Thank you so much. As with our federal partners, Timothy Harrison. Present, uh, Principal Deputy Director of the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy at HHS. John Okutumalare. Thank you. Jonathan John O'Merman. Robin Neblet Fanfare. Present Division Director, um, Division of HIV Prevention, CDC. And I'll follow on Dr. Wheeler, the first woman to serve in that position. We have a lot of firsts around this table. It's amazing, amazing. Ernia Hughes. Hi, good morning, Erna Hughes, uh, Director of the Office of Health Center Investment Oversight and HRSA, and the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, the Health Center Program. Thank you. Laura Cheever. Laura Cheever, uh, HIV AIDS Bureau. We administer the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program at HRSA, uh, and I'm currently in Rockville, Maryland. Thanks. Thank you. Andrea Jackson. Good morning, Andrea Jackson, Senior Advisor in the HIV AIDS Bureau at the Health Resources and Services Administration, where we administer the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. I'm based out of Rockville. Thank you. Thank you. Mehran Masudi. Good morning, uh, Mehran Masudi. I'm the Regional Health Administrator, um, HHS Region 6, based in Dallas. Thank you. Kristen Roja. Uh, good morning. I am a public health advisor with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also based in Rockville, Maryland. Thank you. Mary Glenshaw. Uh, good morning, everyone. Mary Glenshaw, Acting Deputy Director of the NIH Office of AIDS Research. Happy to be here. Thank you. Jessica Lee. Jessica Lee. Michelle Shriver. Michelle Shriver. Rita Harcrow, Rita Harcrow, Casey Knopp. Hi, Casey Knopp, a program and management analyst in the administration for community living, specializing in aging and disability. Thank you. William Dilday, William Dilday, Rodrigo Chavez. Thank you. Sharonda Brown. And Caroline Tallow. Uh, good morning, President, uh, Senior Management Analyst in OIDP and Alternate Designated Federal Officer for Pacha. Thank you. That concludes the roll call. I turn it back over to our co-chairs. Thank you, Kay. We will move right along uh, with the agenda. As many of the members around the Pacha table uh, know, uh, this Sometime last year, we uh, drafted uh, some specific recommendations to uh, the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health and the Secretary of Health to have an enhanced response to what many of us were seeing uh, was a growing uh, and rapidly alarming 
uh, epidemic and outbreak of syphilis. While many jurisdictions were hesitant to use the term, uh, the idea that we knew that there were problems facing our community uh, in terms of transmission, in terms of access to necessary effective treatment and cure. So we are delighted to invite Dr. Timothy Harrison to provide to us an update on the work that has occurred since uh, Pacha's recommendation uh, to do so. Uh, so Dr. Timothy Harrison is our friend and colleague who needs no introduction, but he is currently serving as the Principal Deputy Director at the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Tim. Thank you, Marlene, appreciate that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk with you today about syphilis for a few minutes. <laughs> and I just really want to thank Marlene and Vincent, these co-chairs of Pacha. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation to speak on this important topic. Um, and also our host, uh, host city. I really do appreciate that. Um, you know, I've always, always appreciated historically how Pacha really has risen to the moment uh, to integrate important emerging issues and concerns into its work uh, that affect many of the communities that we, that we, that we, that we serve, uh, whether it's the Affordable Care Act many years ago, uh, the issue of safe and voluntary disclosure, molecular surveillance and cluster detection response, or even Appalachia. You know, we were uh, fortunate to have a visit uh, last uh, fall in West Virginia. Um, in the last summer, as Marlene mentioned, we were in Phoenix, Arizona, where the discussion of syphilis was unavoidable. Uh, and it led to Pacha passing a resolution calling for urgent action to address the escalating cases of syphilis and congenital syphilis. The first of those recommended actions in the Pacha resolution is the development of a federal task force which brings me here today. But before I jump into the task force actions, uh, just for a brief review of what brings us to this moment and level set uh, on our current crisis. And I deliberately did not put a slide up for this. Uh, I didn't want us to, to, to get lost into this data, but I'm gonna quickly go over it. And you probably have seen much of this already. Um, since reaching historic lows in 2000 and 2001, the rate of syphilis, primary and secondary syphilis, and congenital syphilis have increased almost every year. Rates of primary and secondary syphilis increased among both men and women, among all age groups, and in all regions in the United States. Most cases of syphilis in the United States are among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. And syphilis has increased nearly every year among the population, for this population, for about two decades. Gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men continue to be disproportionately impacted by syphilis, accounting for almost half of all male primary and secondary syphilis cases in 2022. In addition, in the United States, approximately half of gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men with primary and secondary syphilis were also persons with HIV. Rates of primary and, and secondary syphilis decreased in almost, in most, excuse me, most racial and eth ethnic groups with greatest increases among non-Hispanic American Indian and Alaska Native persons. And then finally, we are currently experience, experiencing the highest national congenital syphilis rate reported since 1991. Which brings me to the task force. The task force is chaired by Admiral Rachel Levine, the Assistant Secretary uh, for Health, and she's been pushing really hard for concrete actions that will make a difference. 
The task force is a cross-departmental, multi-agency effort representing every essential sector of the United States government necessary to move strategically and urgently. We meet currently once a week, every week. But of course, most of the work exists outside of that meeting. The framework of the task force is anchored by the expected three pillars of data and surveillance, prevent, screen, and diagnose, and treat. And the work is filtered through six subcommittees, very active, very busy subcommittees that really drive this work. Data and surveillance, prevent, screen, and diagnose, treat, all in alignment with the three pillars, but also a congenital syphilis subcommittee, an equity and syndemic uh, subcommittee, and a subcommittee on communications and community engagement. Many thanks to our CDC colleagues for helping the task force identify geographic areas of focus. Using case counts or case reported cases, we landed on 14 jurisdictions accounting for more than 57% of all primary and secondary syphilis cases and nearly 74% of all congenital syphilis cases. In addition, these jurisdictions show significant representation of primary, secondary, and congenital uh, cases among non-Hispanic American Indian, Alaska Native popular persons, non-Hispanic Black African American persons, um, and Hispanic Latino persons. And I'll just put this out there that while the task force is focused on these 14 jurisdictions of priority, it by no means would should suggest that we aren't interested in primary, secondary, congenital syphilis across the nation. And so much of our engagement has included and will continue to include other jurisdictions as well. Since we're in Texas, I thought I'd give you just a little snapshot of syphilis in Texas. And they are one of our 14 priority jurisdictions. And I wanna give you a quick glance. With more than 4,655 primary and secondary cases in 2022 and 922 cases of congenital syphilis, reflecting a 76% increase and a 151% increase respectively between 2018 and 2022. With Hispanic and Latinos carrying about 40% of the primary and secondary syphilis cases and black African American Americans disproportionately affected at more than 25%. And I will call out also the Houston Health Department issued a press release in July of 2023 reporting a syphilis outbreak in Houston, reflecting a 128% increase and a nine-fold rise locally just in congenital syphilis. Just a couple key, key takeaways with, with this slide I want to leave you with. Um, the first is that syphilis, congenital syphilis, is an issue nationally, and it is an issue here in Texas, as Marlene pointed out. Congenital syphilis is preventable. And Texas is one of four states that require testing at all three stages of prenatal care and delivery. And I'll return to this issue as part of my key area of focus. So what has the task force been doing? Uh, beginning in late summer of last year, the task force was convened by Abra Levine, as I indicated, and I'm gonna share with you just a few of the actions uh, that have been undertaken. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. It's really meant to sort of sample some of the things that are going on. There's a much more rich uh, uh, 
illumination of all of the things that are going on, both from the subcommittee perspective, but also the particular agencies that are involved in this effort. And just here back in July, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, HRSA and IHS issued letters to grantees and providers uh, with informational resources. Um, in October of last year, CDC published graphic guidelines, draft guidelines for doxycycline using, uh, for use among certain groups. IHS announced a new national clinical strategic initiative and released STI treatment guidelines. And of course, HHS generated heat maps for those jurisdictions um, that were prioritized under this task force. Just recently in January, many of you are aware that the FDA announced uh, the, the availability of extensive cycling to address by selling uh, shortages. Um, we also held, held two equity workshops, uh, one, one on um, American Indian Alaska Native populations and one a more general one uh, focused on a range of different issues for the population. And I want to emphasize this because so much of what's driving our work through the task force is through this equity lens. Um, we're not going to end this epidemic as it is for HIV without really addressing those disproportionate populations affected and their particular challenges and issues. Um, and then, of course, NIH held a workshop uh, just recently in February about expanding the syphilis treatment uh, re research. And then Admiral Levine convened a provider roundtable, well-attended provider roundtable, really focusing on the critical role that providers from your emergency room department docs to nurses to uh, you name it, uh, were there to really talk about the role of providers in our response. And that work is ongoing. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, this March. We have been conducting conversations with our priority jurisdictions to really get the better sense of what are the drivers and the, and the, uh, the uh, inflection points, points of pain in their, in their jurisdictions. Uh, we're looking at a webinar uh, coming up uh, next month focused on syphilis, the intersection of syphilis, substance use, and child welfare. Um, and of course, we're also really uh, focused on our native populations with some regional outreach and um, observation. I know my time is running out, so let me be quick here. Uh, key areas of focus. And this really is sort of my assessment among the many things that we're really focusing on. There, there's a lot of things that really sort of stand out in terms of where we need to focus our attention. These are just a few of them, a snapshot. One is really addressing the treatment shortage and the related cost concerns and really explore solutions to adequate availability. Another is the use of point of care testing. Uh, there's lots of conversation about its role, particularly in field, in the field, but also with emergency departments and urgent care settings. We're looking at uh, harmonization around the testing guidelines. When and how often do you test pregnant persons for syphilis? And then last but not least is the, the, the task force is called the National Syndemic and Congenital excuse me, the National Syphilis and, Con and Congenital Syphilis Syndemic uh, Federal Task Force for a reason. The focus is really on ensuring that those upstream factors, whether it is substance use, whether it's homelessness or stigma or fear of prosecution, really is a barrier um, uh, to getting tested, getting screened, or uh, uh, coming back for treatment. These are some additional considerations, recognizing that so much of our work will require a level of communication and sharing um, of information, um, really wanting to raise the provider awareness and provide training and diagnose on uh, diagnostic and treatment guidelines for primary and secondary syphilis and congenital syphilis. For many providers, um, syphilis was not necessarily something on their radar. Uh, we thought we had ended syphilis 20 years ago, and so it's back. 
and we must make sure that providers, all providers, are, are educated um, and aware of what uh, needs to happen in their particular setting. Public awareness, very low. Most folks probably didn't know that there was a syphilis crisis. Um, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. But it's clearly something that we need to up the, the public awareness. And I've seen some campaigns across the country in some places at, at bus stops and other places about syphilis. Uh, we we'll perhaps need more of that, um, you know, in order for folks to, to be aware, not just generally, but for their own particular risk. Um, and then last but not least, it's sort of sharing of best practices. One of the good things about conversations with providers and some of the jurisdictions we've talked to is their desire to learn what other folks are doing, like what other states are doing, what other providers are doing, how are they being innovative, how are they responding. And so we want to facilitate an opportunity for them to cross share and share those examples, those innovative ideas, whether it's an app or, uh, or, or some other tool that they're using that might be uh, recommended. That is a nutshell, some of the actions we're going on. I know that was quick, but I will say this, you know, um, the folks on this task force, and there are, there are over 200 officially on this task force, and many of them are here today, are really driving hard around this issue, recognizing that this perhaps was not in the plan when their 2023 year started out. Um, but it's important that this is an urgent, uh, urgent issue and we understand the synergies, obviously, with our HIV, HIV work, but also particularly just for the communities that we serve. And so I want to thank you for your time, and I don't know if we have time for questions or not. I really just have to say thank you to Dr. Harrison, and, and more importantly, thank you to Dr. Admiral Levine for her leadership. When this came to her attention, the swiftness and urgency in her response uh, does not go unnoticed. So um, as a Pacha uh, leader, I certainly appreciate uh, that level of engagement. And for all of our federal colleagues who are equally engaged and involved in pushing the needle here, you know, there are real challenges to battling something, uh, such simplistic ways of approaching and curing and eradicating syphilis. It's difficult especially in places like Texas, where access to the needed and necessary treatments are hard uh, for many communities. So I just know that the work will continue and just wanted to say thank you. I will allow for at least one question from a Pacha member from around the table. If there is any urgent burning question someone may have for Tim, go ahead. So Dr. Harrison, thank you so much uh, for that terrific presentation. I uh, just want to comment and then a, a, a very focused question. So a couple of observations. I was really happy to hear you continue to reference syphilis and congenital syphilis, largely because a lot of the focus is on congenital syphilis, but the data suggests that it's broader than con congenital syphilis. I also um, really was appreciative of the endemic perspective. You know, I think it's no surprise that you know, right now, the reportable STIs in our country have been increasing all time high. And so it's not just syphilis, it's a range of sexually transmitted infections that have been a hidden epidemic that we haven't made progress on. My question is, if I think about the data among young people in terms of STIs, uh, about half of the incident cases are among young people. So I'm curious about youth and syphilis, particularly young MSM of color. Great question. Um, first, absolutely, it was intentional to, to have the syphilis and digital syphilis as sort of parallel tracks. While the task force is really pushing on the congenital syphilis, it is a priority, we understand that there's a parallel track. You don't get congenital syphilis unless there's syphilis. Uh, so we understand that. Um, and the disproportionate impact among gay and bisexual men of color, absolutely, is something that we don't want to lose sight of. And while so much of that presentation seems to center on the congenital syphilis piece, there are many other things that are more global in our perspective that will have, have absolute reach in terms of funding flexibilities and other things that are going on uh, that will field testing, uh, which have great uh, connection. Um, we have not centered on youth 
uh, in our in our work so far, but it's definitely something we we un I fully anticipate being part of the ongoing conversation. Um, one of the things that we are doing when we are looking to partner with our jurisdictions is to get an idea of where are those press points in those jurisdictions. Is it you? Is it folks? Is it is it gay and bisexual men? And that's where we want to want to to assist the states in their efforts. So. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Thanks. I want to say thanks, Marlene, because Admiral Levine's leadership, I want to thank Pacha because that meeting in June and that sort of uh, call, we ran back home literally and met immediately with Admiral Levine and she immediately took action. Um, if you have the opportunity to work closely with her, she is a vac very action-oriented person, and so we appreciate that. I also want to say a special thanks to the community, as the partners, for raising and lifting this, this effort. You know, we had many conversations with David Harvey and colleagues and others to say, you know, this is urgent and, and keep pressing on this to close the loop on that. We're doing all this incredible work uh, with our federal partners. And we've got to continue, but to press out those messages with communities and how do we intentionally and strategically do that is that key. So uh, working with our colleagues in the next month, of, month or two to talk about how do we do that. And so we'll be leaning uh, and working collaboratively with our partners in that effort because uh, it, it, it's not just a federal, it is a federal task force because we're pushing with our agencies. And when I say pushing with our agencies, we have these conversations where we can't do that and we can't do that. I'm like, okay, what can we do? <laughs> so if we can't do that, what can we do? Give me to yes um, and think out the box, all the way out the box. So how do we make a difference and show impact and not show impact in five years from now? Mm -hmm. What can we do that we can see some impact uh, and, and change now? So that's the urgency of it uh, for us. Yeah. Okay, I'll allow one more. Jesse, it looks like you're <laughs> getting in queue there. Go ahead. Oh. oh, and Paul. I didn't see you, Paul. Go ahead, Paul, and then Jesse, and we'll move. Thank you so much, Tim, for that important update. I just want to suggest and urge that our, because CHAC has a broader charter than the than Pacha, that our uh, CHAC liaison, Wendy, I know you're on the call, uh, that you continue to think with us together as to what Pacha should and can do on this endemic issue uh, and how Pacha can support the CHAC in your efforts to uh, support the efforts that the uh, task forces do. 100%. You know, got to be the pushy queen that I am. So thank you. First of all, I just want to say to all the federal partners, thank you so much for moving so quickly. I have never seen the government move as fast and as comprehensively as you have in putting this together. And it's been extraordinarily impressive. And I think that as we saw when we saw all of the slides, the overlay between where HIV lives and where STIs live are the exact same places. And so we, we, we have to acknowledge that this is a part of our work and that this is a critical piece. And, and as Jesse and I know, we, we work a lot with David Harvey at NCSD, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask our CDC and her partners, how are we going to figure out what a syndemic solution really looks like? You know, we all talk about a syndemic solution, but how do we actually implement it and make it real? And where it's going to happen, at least around HIV, is going to be around HRSA and it's going to be around CDC because of U equals U. And so we have this opportunity to create real synergy so that HIV, once again, is bigger than just HIV. So that HIV has an opportunity to end not just the HIV epidemic, but the epidemics of STIs. Excellent important just, comment. Could, Go ahead, say, please. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And I would just, just two things. One, thank you for your comments about the uh, federal work. Uh, collaboration at the federal level is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> uh, it takes it takes work. It takes work uh, to bring multiple departments, multiple agencies together. Um, and so I really do appreciate the level of commitment and effort from our federal partners. Because it's not always easy. It's not always, particularly if, if, if you're collaborating on something that's not, not necessarily the heart of what you do normally. Uh, so I appreciate that. 
in terms of the other thing uh, you you mentioned, you know, um, I was going to say we we understand that um, as I should indicate that the syndemic role is really cr really crucial, and we, we we put that in the name of the task force intentionally, and understood you know both in you know preliminarily talking to folks that the drivers those things that were really causing those pain points uh, were all part of that host of syndemic uh, issue. And so uh, working with um, our colleagues others from, from CDC to HRSA to NIH to, to Indian Health Service to FDA, all sort of thinking along those veins. But what I also say though is so much of the syndemic experience that we're gonna learn from is already occurring at the local level. By necessity, uh, many jurisdictions are already thinking in those veins. And we learned that when we've gone out, they're already thinking along those lines. Um, uh, and so the ways in which we can support them to do that, uh, I completely agree. And we, I think we continue to think around, around those strategic and innovative ways to do so. Thank you again. And uh, we will continue to ensure that uh, Pacha is updated about the course of the work. And I do invite uh, members to continue to think through uh, recommendations and thoughts about how we might be able to do, I think a lot of what Kay is describing, uh, the level of support and dissemination of the work that is occurring across our federal partners and how can we make or help to make those be realized at the state and local level. Um, we are going to move right along. We have uh, Pacha subcommittee updates. Uh, don't worry for those of you looking at your watches. We always make up time. I'm completely committed and know that we will do that. Uh, but much of uh, what happens between these full council meetings is the real meat and potatoes of Pacha. Uh, most of the work is done in subcommittee. And so we often uh, hear report outs from much of that work. And so we will begin our subcommittee updates uh, with our newly formed, uh, in a minute, we will no longer be able to say newly formed uh, because you all have hit the ground running and are off to mighty, mighty work. So I will turn the floor over to our aging with HIV, long-term and lifetime survivors, subcommittee co-chairs, Alicia Diggs and Jesse Miley. Thank you, Marlene. It has been a pleasure co-chairing our new for today, <laughs> Aging and with HIV Long-Term and Lifetime Survivors Subcommittee with my fellow co-chair, Jesse Milan. Our fabulous team members consist of Jeff Taylor, Paul Kawada, Vincent Guillermo Ramos, and Kayla Quimley. We, we are a new subcommittee and we are all passionate about promoting the health and well-being of long-term and lifetime survivors and all who are aging with HIV. When we first started together as a subcommittee, we worked on creating our subcommittee charge, which is to provide advice on enhancing the federal response to medical, social, and mental health needs of people aging with HIV, including long-term and lifetime survivors, provide recommendations for increasing access to and improving comprehensive and integrated health care, funding HIV and aging research, support in social services, benefits, and resources that promote the health and well-being of people aging with HIV. We as a subcommittee plan to stand on that charge. For our next meeting, we invited Laura Cheever of HRSA to share the work of her, that HRSA is doing specific to persons aging with HIV. And just to share, HRSA's mission is to provide leadership and resources to advance the health, the HIV care and treatment to improve health outcomes and reduce health disparities for people with HIV and affected communities. We then invited Rita Hargrove, Director of the Office of HIV AIDS Housing, who shared the role that HUD is playing in helping people who are aging with HIV as well as long-term and lifetime survivors through the HOPWA program, which is the only federally program 
um, federal program dedicated to the housing needs of low income persons, persons with HIV AIDS and their families. So I will now pass it to Jesse, who will add additional remarks and what our next steps are as a committee. That's great. Thank you so much, Alicia. Uh, for those of us who are aging with HIV, this has been an opportunity for us to come together and bring dis disparate organizations and constituencies together who are all addressing HIV and aging. Just on this committee, we have representatives from the coalition that's being run by NMAC, by the national, by the HIV and Aging Policy Action Coalition that's at AIDS United, by the HIV and Aging Research Project, um, as well as connections to the Reunion Project and Let's Kick Ass as well. So all of those constituencies are coming together through this committee. You recall that at the 79th meeting of Pacha, we had an opportunity to do some level setting about the biomedical issues that people living with HIV are facing, as well as the financial and mental health issues. So we thank the two Jeffs who did that, Jeff Dr. Jeff Kwong, from, who is a former president of ANAC and who's at Rutgers, who did a very excellent job giving us some understanding of the biomedical issues that we're facing. And I've actually used his slides in other presentations and Jeff Berry from the Reunion Project for giving us some guidance around exactly what the community is facing with regard to mental health and financial and social issues. We thank, uh, we thank you, Laura. I know you're, you're, you're listening and that you're participating for your important uh, update with us around the Ryan White program and also to Rita for what we learned about HUD. First, I want to say that what we learned from HUD was not only about what the HOPWA program can and cannot do to support financially people living with HIV for housing opportunities, but we learned that HUD has a, has a plethora of other opportunities that are perhaps untapped for how the HIV and aging community can develop resources in the communities for actual housing opportunities for people who are aging with HIV. So we're going to be exploring more of those. This is a heads up and a warning that CDC, we will be reaching out to you to talk about what CDC is doing and to our colleagues from CMS, we especially have an opportunity to talk with you and we're looking forward to that. And I raise that because Laura Cheever, you said something at our meeting that was very helpful. You reminded us in our meeting that you had just gone through with your sister transitioning your sister from private health insurance to Medicare. Oh my God. <laughs> For those of us who are aging with HIV, who are facing that transition, what you said was huge because that is the gap that so many of us are facing as we age toward that Medicare eligibility. How do we make the change from private insurance to whatever might happen that would cover all of the costs for our meds and to make sure that we're not falling into an enormous donut hole of, of personal cost sharing? So those issues will be on the table for us in the following months as to how we work with CMS and CDC, particularly to find out what the opportunities may be, just as we've learned about the incredible opportunities that exist both with HUD and with, and with the Ryan White program. So stand by. We are on this, and I hope that by the end of the year, we'll have some strong recommendations, especially recommendations that we will be bringing to the co-chairs um, co retreat on Friday of this week. Thank you. Yeah, they can they can get a round of applause <laughs> for a new committee. <laughs> As you can see, they are passionate, dedicated, and are about accomplishing some change. So I really appreciate you guys' leadership. And next, we will pivot to ending the HIV epidemic subcommittee. Guillermo Chacon and Tori Cooper, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, thank you all for your updates and good morning again to everyone. Uh, the H H Ending the HIV epidemic uh, subcommittee, one of the things that we often discuss is what exactly does it mean to end the HIV epidemic? And so some of the things we've come up as a subcommittee are ensuring that all, it, it, does ending the epidemic mean ensuring that all people who are living with HIV get to an undetectable viral load? Certainly that's one way to end the HIV epidemic but also knowing that medically that's impossible. Does it mean ensuring access to PrEP services for all people who could get an HIV diagnosis in their lifetime? Certainly, that's one way to end the HIV epidemic, and it's something that we discuss quite often. Um, 
What it does mean is a redistri redistribution of wealth and power structures to ensure equitable health outcomes for all people, understanding that equity and equality are not the same thing. Equality only works when people start off and throughout the course of their life have the exact same health um, access to everything. That's not the case. We have people around this table who started off at different places in the world and will end up at different places in the world. Equity says that people get what it is that they need and the folks who need the most get the most. So our goal is always to ensure equitable health outcomes for better life expectancy, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have to redistrib redistribute the wealth and power structures in HIV healthcare systems in order to accomplish that. It also means prioritizing the needs of folks whom society deems as marginalized. That includes many of the folks in this room and the communities that we serve. It also means that trans and gender expansive people need to be prioritized because far too often we are not. Nobody clap for that? <laughs> It means that women, regardless as to how you got to your womanhood, <laughs> some of you will catch that later, <laughs> need to be prioritized. It means that BIPOC, that's Black, Indigenous people of color, Black and Indigenous people of color, who's everybody that's not white, are also prioritized. It also means substance users are prioritized. It also means that people who are experienced unhoused or experiencing homelessness are prioritized. It also means that people who have mental health issues, whether diagnosed or not, are prioritized. And it means providing all of those things that we refer to as the, uh, the social determinants of health for all people who are uh, living with HIV and folks who are at risk of contracting HIV in their lifetime. Now I'll pass the mic over to Guillermo. <laughs> Sorry, Tori. I love it. Uh, our distinguished members of the subcommittee are uh, Dr. Sean, uh, Rania Copeland, Mackenzie Copley, Dr. Ramos, Paul Kawara, Dubia Lozano, uh, DeAndre Moore, Laura, Patrero, Pat Lo Laura Patre Platero, sorry, Natalie Sanchez, Dr. Sullivan, uh, Dr. Hansel, and Afina Ward. And we are so pleased to acknowledge the subcommittee members because as uh, our distinguished uh, co-chairs remind us, it's about uh, if how PACHA will generate uh, traction. One of the focus of our subcommittee is to acknowledge the amazing work done and delivered by Chuck, uh, focus on workforce development. We aiming to partner with Chuck in advance, we will create a subcommittee that will focus on workforce development and, and approach that topic from a holistic perspective. And uh, one of the, some of the areas also that we're gonna be focused, as Tori was mentioning, was also to try to focus on expanding the reach and, and across all subcommittees because ending the epidemic is, is the priority toward 2030, understanding that we're gonna pause and assess in January 2025, where we are toward 2030. And we're looking forward to, um, as Apache, again, you know, focus on that, advance from a syndemic approach. I think Paul raised the issue, and I know it's the commitment from our both co-chairs that we need to acknowledge, address, and respond uh, across the boards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guillermo and Tori. And next we will uh, hear from our Stigma and Disparities subcommittee. Uh, they believe they're the best subcommittee of PACHA, uh, but it- We know that we're the best subcommittee of PACHA. <laughs> they are Dr. Best. Leo Moore and Ronya Copeland, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Thank you. Good morning, Pacha members, federal partners, and honored guests. Uh, since the last full council meeting, the Stigma and Disparities Committee has been booked and busy. 
Rania and I, with the help of the Office of Infectious Disease Policy and Rosalie and Associates, hosted our in-person strategic planning session in Los Angeles on February 12th and 13th of this year. During the meeting, our members discussed many topics of interest regarding stigma and disparities affecting people living with and impacted by HIV. We subsequently identified six key themes, HIV criminalization and discrimination, HIV and housing, increasing and enhancing the HIV workforce, access to PrEP, COVID-19 and HIV, priority populations disproportionately affected by HIV, um, and that's all six of our, of our key themes. Our ultimate goal was to narrow to three themes. So members rated each theme based on potential for PACHA to have an impact in the near term, which is within one year, impact uh, in the long term, about one year or more, uh, and topics that PACHA has already invested in and should continue to pursue. So subsequently, three work groups were established. Our stigma disruption work group, which is led by Daphina Ward, the prep and pep work group led by Natalie Sanchez, and the HIV Criminalization and Discrimination Work Group led by Marvell Terry II. Uh, this group has met to discuss the new CDC NOFO and language uh, including regard, included regarding cluster detection and response, as well as the CDC guidance provided to health departments. We've also had a presentation on HIV criminalization by the Center for HIV Law and Policy, which was, was presented by Kay Greenberg, Jada Hicks, and Sean McCormick. Uh, I will turn it over to Rania for updates on the stigma disruption prep and pep and any other updates she'd like to provide. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much to uh, our, our stigma disparity subcommittee members. I don't know if they knew what they were signing up for uh, <laughs> when they uh, joined our, our, our <laughs> committee, um, but Leo and I knew um, that we have a long legacy of amazing stigma disparity co-chairs uh, that we come after. And I think for so many of us that do this work, it's literally about disparities and how we end them. And so we are trying to kind of continue to hold that mantle up. Um, for our prep and uh, our prep work group that's led by uh, Natalie, we're focusing a lot on how we increase prep awareness. So we've talked a bit to um, HIV.gov to think about is an awareness day focused on prep, something that Pacha might want to get behind. And so we're having a lot of conversations around that. And then our, um, our stigma disruption uh, work group led by Dafina Ward is having conversations around how we can really have some tangible impact around stigma. I think stigma is one of the uh, big issues when it comes to HIV that we haven't seen a lot of movement around. It's something we talk a lot about, um, but how do we fund it? How do we measure it? And so they're having a lot of conversation right now and looking into models around measuring stigma and how do we respond to stigma. Uh, so we have some amazing work groups that I think also really uh, usher in uh, new leadership into Pacha as well, um, a step into what leadership within Pacha looks like. So we're excited about that. Uh, and and uh, looking forward to reading out what happens next over the next few months and for our uh, PACHA co-chairs strategic planning session on Friday, where hopefully we can align with other uh, uh, committees to see how we coordinate um, and align a lot of the work that we're doing in stigma disparities we're realizing can sit in other work groups or and sit in other committees. And so we're figuring out what that alignment looks like. So uh, thank you all so much. And our fourth committee, uh, our global committee, is expertly led by Dr. Jen Cates and Dr. Patrick Sullivan. And so I will allow them an opportunity to talk about their action and their next steps. Um, I, I'm happy to uh, start and just uh, provide the perspective that uh, although PACHA convenes to inform the ending the HIV uh, epidemic and, um, and interact with our federal partners, ONAP and state partners, uh, just to remind us that we're part of a global epidemic and when we get there, we'll do it together. Uh, and so, um, and, and I think that's largely because a lot of the factors that, that make it challenging to do HIV prevention and to serve uh, people who are living with HIV, like poverty, stigma, lack of information, lack of resources, lack of trusting government um, are really global issues. So this, the global subcommittee is charged with providing advice on um, the HIV response and particularly identifying lessons that have been learned globally that we may be able to incorporate or deploy in the United States to improve our own response and to work with international partners to decrease the burden of HIV and AIDS. So our members um, 
We'll hear from Jen uh, Cates in a, in a moment, but also Marlene McNeese, Jesse Milan, DeAndre Moore, and Carol Treston are our subcommittee members. And we've really been engaged in a process of thinking about what it means um, to engage in bi-directional learning with global partners and to come um, both uh, open to sharing our experiences and, uh, and with humility to learn what's being done in other parts of the world that we can learn from. And so some of the areas that we've identified where uh, we, kn we know uh, that we've uh, in some cases had success in the US and in some cases we've seen successes in other parts of the world include rapid start of antiretrovirals for people who are diagnosed with HIV, um, PrEP programs, um, to all those communities that might benefit, benefit from PrEP, HIV self-testing, uh, which is uh, um, something that, uh, that, that CDC is currently supporting uh, a program that has really ramped up the availability of um, free rapid tests in the United States, and there's also um, important global progress on this. And then thinking um, about, uh, in the U.S., about the mechanisms of funding and working uh, with implementing partners and, um, and what lessons we can learn from global activities. So to this point, we've really uh, framed out this, uh, this agenda. Um, we've really um, talked, I think, in some depth and detail about what it means to, to come with humility and to engage in bi-directional learning. And we've had informational calls with federal partners to talk about this work plan in the process of identifying global partners um, to begin this exchange of information. So I'll, with that, I'll turn things over to Jen, who is um, Jen Cates. Hi, everybody. Again, sorry I can't be there in person. Um, thank you, Patrick, um, and to the other subcommittee members. Uh, I, I don't have too much to add, except to say that we've also seen our um, role as a subcommittee in sharing information on what is happening with PEPFAR, the signature global health uh, uh, effort uh, of, of the USG on HIV. And I'm, I'm happy to report today that after months of a stalled process, uh, as part of the omnibus bill that passed a few days ago, PEPFAR was reauthorized for a year. So it's a shorter term uh, reauthorization. Um, but it does bring the program some uh, certainty for now, and um, and this is a topic we could discuss further at PACHA, but that I wanted to report that to this group. And also to add to what Patrick said, one, we also see our role as being informative and educational to those uh, in on PACHA and the larger community that don't always work on global uh, HIV issues and may want to hear about uh, how things are going, what the what the USG does do. So we are very open to your input and and uh, suggestions in that area. Thanks very much. So hopefully you all can hear of uh, the tremendous amount of work uh, that PACHA members are uh, tasked with. Uh, completing uh, both what we've done since our last meeting and what we have planned uh, for the future. As alluded to by several of the subcommittee uh, chairs, we do have a scheduled strategic planning uh, conversation coming up this Friday. Uh, so how we hear, what we hear, uh, both during the meeting as well as during the uh, public comment and Pacha to the People engagement will inform what PACHA will prioritize for the upcoming year and beyond. So it is critical for those of you who are watching or listening online, those who are in the room, to please come forward with your uh, experience, uh, your recommendations uh, for how you see changes uh, for this response that will be impactful. Uh, we do uh, pride ourselves on making sure that we are the conduit to community that we hear uh, what you're experiencing and we take that into consideration and push for those changes at the federal level. Uh, so I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. And then we will move right along. Uh, hopefully we will make up some time, but we will pivot now to uh, the bulk of our conversation and, and why I really wanted to begin with a particular level set about where we are with ending the HIV epidemic in Texas. Uh, so the title of this panel is Setting the Stage and, uh, and Listening to County Perspectives. Uh, we will hear from some esteemed colleagues in the work 
throughout the state uh, to talk about challenges, successes. This is Texas. <laughs> Opportunities uh, in the response uh, from their unique perspectives. We will try to take a break and then come back with the second half of this panel where we will hear from implementers of EHE programs and services uh, here uh, in Houston and from across Texas uh, and their perspectives. Uh, and before we launch in, uh, we did uh, invite and want to engage uh, some elected elite leadership in Texas to join us in this conversation. Uh, so I do want to take just a brief second uh, to recognize a long-term uh, HIV advocate, ally, friend uh, in the work, Ms. State uh, Representative Jolanda Jones is with us this morning. <laughs> Jolanda is now transitioned as a state-level representative, and that's exactly where we need her right now. Uh, but she was a long-term member on Houston City Council as well. So thank you for your years of support and years of work. I will uh, now sort of pivot and turn it over to DeAndre who will co-facilitate uh, this panel with me. I'll have him make remarks and he'll facilitate the first half of our panel. Awesome, thank you, Ms. Marlene. Uh, good morning to everybody. Good morning, POTCH members and our federal partners and all of you all who are here visiting from across the state of Texas. I uh, just wanna say thank you for making time to be here with us to have this important conversation and this dialogue. And thank you to our esteemed panel guests of guests who will be here to join in with us and provide some insight from your background and, and, and your expertise um, to all of us here today. Um, I'm excited that you all are here. I'm excited to hear about the different county perspectives. I am a native of Beaumont, Texas, which would be considered a rural part of Texas. Um, there are even more rural areas. Um, I see some of my, my, uh, my hometown heroes in the back who are also here from Beaumont, Texas to represent, and some of them we will hear from later on today. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to dive into this conversation to hear how the landscape in Texas, um, things are from a political perspective, also as well as from the, the county and the health departments as well, and how we navigate through that here in Texas. And I'm excited to hear about what we can do as Pacha members, but also as community members across the state to help better advance um, progressive, um, the progressive movement to, to, to better provide health care to those living with HIV or most vulnerable to HIV. Um, we're going to start and jump right into it. Um, first off with, okay, cool. Um, Dr. Thomas uh, Giordano. Is it right? Cool. Cool. Uh, professor, the professor of medicine, chief section of infectious diseases and director of Texas Development Center for AIDS Research at the Baylor College of Medicine, who will provide us with a PowerPoint a presentation to begin with. Um, Dr. Giordano. Thanks, DeAndre. <clears throat> and thank you, Marlene and Vincent, for uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, I was charged with um, uh, trying to sort of give us some common groundwork about what's happening in Texas. There, you'll hear a lot more about this from the other speakers over the course of the two days. Uh, so this is just sort of to give us a, a little bit of uh, foundation. So there we go. So um, this is a slide provided by the Department of State uh, Health Services uh, at the Texas level for the care continuum result. Everyone knows what the care continuum is. Um, for the state of Texas uh, compared to the United States. Different years, admittedly, but this is the most recent uh, data available for both. And you can see, and this, assume, this, is, this starts with people diagnosed with HIV. So the undiagnosed is roughly 13, 14%. It may be a touch higher in Texas. Uh, it's lower in other places, but at the US level, it's, it's around that, that area. So um, as you can see, if we start with 100% diagnosed, there are about uh, 78, I think, got to put my glasses on, 78% are, have some care, evidence of care in Texas, 57% have met the definition for retained in care, 61% are virally suppressed, and obviously that's our critical clinical outcome as well as a critical prevention outcome, uh, and that compares to about, uh, these numbers are in some ways uh, worse than where we are at the, at the United States level, um, especially when you talk about the viral suppression numbers. The, other, the others are comparable, maybe a little better in the state. Definitions should be comparable, but the virally suppressed number in Texas lags by 4%, 65% versus 61%. Oops. So 
diving into this a little bit, there, the, I was provided some data on uh, with, at the state level, uh, are there disparities in viral load suppression, specifically focusing on that critical outcome? Um, and there are. Uh, these are highlighted on the right uh, of the slide. Uh, among the youth in the state of Texas, the viral load suppression level is slightly lower than among the older. And you can see that the middle age, uh, 55 to 64, is actually the peak of viral load suppression. That's not different, I don't think, than most other places in the US, uh, even though the absolute numbers might be different. There are racial and ethnic disparities in viral load suppression, 56% suppression among our black uh, people with HIV and 62% among uh, Hispanic people with HIV versus 67% uh, suppression among white people with HIV. Obviously a large disparity there. People who inject drugs have a low rate of viral suppression, 53%. Uh, that goes up a little uh, bit for people who inject and are uh, men who have sex with men. Heterosexual population is 60% and then MSM 63%. And uh, gender, uh, the transgender women have a lower suppression rate, 58% versus cis women, 60%, cis men, 61%, and tran transgender men, very high at 76%, although admittedly a very small population when you look at the absolute numbers that the state provided. So there's clearly some notable disparities along familiar lines of race, sex, and uh, HIV uh, risk factors. Yep. So in terms of uh, prevalence and uh, incidence, um, text, this is an incidence slide. So new HIV diagnoses over time uh, you can see this starts at 2010 and ends in 2019. The red bars are the absolute number of new diagnoses of HIV. And that is relatively flat, maybe on the downward slope uh, into 2019. The blue line, uh, because Texas has a growing state population, is adjusted for the population. And so you see a larger decline in the incidence per 100,000 population. Um, uh, that was so Texas is making some progress in reducing the number of HIV uh, incident diagnoses uh, in the 2010 to 2019 range. Just last night, I was given some data on new diagnoses uh, in subsequent years, and those are added here. Um, now, you can see a large increase. Now, we have to, and I adjusted this for the scale. Uh, so these are comparable scales. Now, everyone knows 2020 was severely impacted by COVID. And across the country, the CDC data show that there was a big drop in number of new diagnoses in HIV, of HIV um, at, in all jurisdictions. Uh, so 2019, big decline, is, or 2020, I'm sorry. Remember, COVID really hit us in 2020. 2019 was fine. Uh, 2020, not surprising, there's a big drop. So the question in the increase in 2021 and 2022 is, is this just a catch up? Are these people who would have been diagnosed earlier uh, had there not been the disruptions of the pandemic or is this actually a rising incidence? The population has grown. I don't have incident data uh, uh, normalized per 100,000, but no doubt the blue line would be going up at this point. The que but again, is this, is this just a COVID uh, rebound effect or is this a true rise in incidence? And we don't know yet. Um, in terms of uh, some stratified uh, data by race uh, and by sex, um, the, these data I don't have any updates on. So I can't tell you what, what happened after 2019. Uh, so this is just raw data from uh, 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 standardized per population um, numbers uh, showing large declines, um, especially in the multi-race and um, other populations uh, and in terms of race and ethnicity, somewhat smaller declines in Hispanic, Black, and white populations. The Looking at the new diagnoses, the raw data that were provided for 2020, 2021, and 2022, 
the increases that we saw in the whole population are reflected in the subpopulations who are black, Hispanic, and white, not surprisingly. Um, uh, and if you look at it by, um, by sex at birth, uh, declines in both men and women at birth. Again, both men and women then show an increase in the number of new diagnoses in 2021 uh, and 2022 uh, as expected. So I want to pivot now to talk about, so that's the basic dem demographics, a little bit of statistics on what's happening in the state. Pivot now to some of the strengths, some of the things um, that are really noteworthy for what's happening in Texas. One of which is our Developmental Center for AIDS Research. Um, this was funded by the NIH in 2021. And the map that's kind of hard to see demonstrates the state of HIV and AIDS Centers for AIDS Research in the U.S. at the time we were awarded the, uh, the, the center. As you can see, um, the, the blue dots and the blue states are the priority jurisdictions for the EHE effort. The red, uh, the red um, AIDS ribbons are where the Centers for AIDS and, and similar centers were located at that point. And there's a huge gap in Texas and in Mississippi. And so by bringing a Center for AIDS Research, we are partially filling that gap. Not completely, but at least partially filling that gap. Three institutions in the state of Texas have about half of all the NIH funding for HIV research. Um, and those institutions are Baylor College of Medicine here in Houston, Texas Biomedical Research Institute in San Antonio, uh, and the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Uh, one component of which is the School of Public Health that you're sitting in right now. And so uh, we partnered uh, to, to uh, apply for a Center for AIDS Research and we were funded. We offer synergistic expertise in virology at Baylor, uh, a lot of uh, multi-omics, genomics and proteomics and other omics, uh, deep science kind of fields in, at Baylor, um, clinical research and uh, pediatric research at Baylor. UT Health has an ACTG and uh, HIV Networks clinical trials site that is longstanding and excellent. Uh, so they have the expertise in network clinical trials, biostatistics, comorbidities research is a strength there. And then Texas Biomed does really foundational work in vaccines and cure research using, because they have a non-human primate uh, center there. And so they have a lot of work going on there in those areas, as well as uh, co-infection with tuberculosis. So, our vision is to be a statewide resource um, uh, for uh, helping end the HIV epidemic, to increase the NIH-funded research um, in, and the number of NIH-funded researchers focusing on HIV in the state, um, grow this Center for AIDS research into additional institutions, and then become a full CIFAR. We are a developmental CIFAR, not a full CIFAR yet, um, so that we can make a, a larger impact on the epidemic. We have a number of cores, science cores, to help our investigators. We, importantly, were funded for a, an implementation science hub to take the discoveries not only made here, but also around the country and help them be implemented not only here in Houston and Texas, but also around the country. So that implementation science hub is critical to our success. Uh, we have a pilot grant program, uh, a lot of supplements for the ending the HIV epidemic, and then we also have an annual conference next week that anyone is welcome to attend if they would like to do so. I want to talk a little bit about our AIDS education training center that's also uh, housed here at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, Shiro Patel and Melanie Goble lead that effort. Um, it's, the, it's funded by HRSA as an AIDS education training center. It's called the Houston AETC. It's based at Baylor. And this has local impact. Um, there's a Houston Harris County Rapid Start program for rapidly initiate, initiating uh, antiretrovirals. What the AIDS Education Training Center is really focusing on implementing the best practices outside of the traditional academic centers and the health centers that are served by those academic centers. So it's a, they've used pro Project ECHO models to really grow the number of people doing Rapid Start locally. They're also uh, participating in that Rapid Start initiative, leading it at the state level. And you can see the number of cities across the state that they're touching with that initiative to try to uh, move the needle on Rapid Start. And they're also leading uh, at a national level to um, uh, do more HIV testing and uh, prevention. Uh, all of this is uh, not research. This is all implementation 
of proven uh, intervention. So we have a role in leading uh, at the national, local, and uh, state level in these uh, initiatives. So the, the CIFAR is a, is, a, is a great contribution. The AATC is another one. Uh, I wanna, at Harris Health System, we were the first uh, program in the country, as far as we know, to implement routine universal screening. Thank you, Don. Routine universal screening for HIV opt-out approach using standard uh, laboratory testing, recognizing that uh, ERs rarely have someone out the door in three hours, right? Especially county-funded emergency rooms. And so why, why not use a standard lab test that has high reliability, more so than a rapid test, that we can do way, fat, way uh, uh, higher volume, that we don't have all the quality control issues around storing those rapid tests at the right temperature, making sure they're not expired. The lab knows how to do tests, let them do the test, uh, and not have to hire an army of people to sit in the ER and do two tests an hour maybe, yeah. when the lab can do it really quickly. To our knowledge, we were the first to implement that. That is now the approach endorsed by CDC our RUSH program has done over a million HIV tests since we implemented it in 2008. Um, we've died, we, I heard at one point we were the largest single uh, entity diagnosing HIV in the city of Houston. Um, and so this is a critical program. Uh, it's an opt-out program. Uh, people are tested if they're gonna have a blood draw for other reasons. Um, we started in 2008, and we're making about two new diagnoses per thousand tests done. It's cost of, of it's affordable because even though large portions of our population served in the Harris Health System are not insured, it doesn't take a it only takes a few, about a third of the people who have HIV, or I'm sorry, who have any kind of insurance, to be able to make this uh, uh, at least a budget neutral because the reimbursement is sufficient. Um, it is uh, struggling a little bit now because of COVID. I will admit the numbers have declined and we're trying to rebuild our testing numbers up. We have on-site service linkage workers that then help people link to care if they're, if they're diagnosed. Um, so this is a great, uh, uh, a great program that we are committed to sustaining. We also rolled it out to the clinics Again, you don't need a rapid test in a clinic. These are people establishing or in care longitudinally. And so that is a, that's a, a very successful component of our program. And you can see we're testing a large volume of patients. There are data showing that about 70% of people who get uh, outpatient care in Harris Health System have had an HIV test at least once. So that's an amazing penetration into the population. Um, and then another, another uh, program I want to highlight is our sharing science program. About, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, in discussion with the health department, Marlene and others, uh, we developed this program because we realized our community participates in research. They volunteer for research. They never hear the results of the research, right? They, they, they you know, they're not reading the scientific journals. They're, they're, uh, they don't, they, they participate, but they get no feedback, unless it's a clinical trial where you're kind of, the IRB has to do it, right? And that's totally appropriate. But if it's a survey, if it's a study of, uh, of uh, basic science approach, they don't get the results because there's just no uh, human subjects uh, requirement to do that. And so we decided to change that uh, and thank the community by sharing those results back. So we developed this in partnership, the CIFAR, the Houston Health Department and the AETC, the old CIFAR before us, uh, that's a long story, I don't wanna get into that, but it is a CIFAR uh, collaboration with AETC and the Health Department. Um, we, we, I read every slide and make sure, we invite our speakers that uh, the community is interested in hearing from on topics that they're interested in. I read every slide to make sure it's all in lay language. They have a brief time to present and then there's a lot of discussion back and forth. It's been wildly successful. We get 80 to 100 people each year we've done this. They, the community loves it. The, the academic, academic researchers love it because they get to engage with the community. And if you're in a lab all day, you don't usually get to do that. Um, the Ryan White Planning Council sends members, the CPG send members. It's a lot of fun. Um, it really is one of my favorite events of the year to have this event. Um, we also, of course, have other really strong community engagement. I listed a few there, but um, I think the sharing science is quite unique and I'm proud of that. 
Mm, okay. And then last two slides here, three slides. Um, so to summarize some of the challenges, you're going to hear a lot more about this as the days go on. We have a very engaged community, uh, as you can see here by the turnout. We have really visible, dedicated, creative, local public health and clinical leadership. We have substantial research. Um, we have a very collaborative environment uh, in the state of Texas in HIV. We're all, we know each other, we work together, we, we do collaborate. There's not a lot of competition between the institutions. We recognize that we're, we have to collaborate in order to succeed. It's a solution-oriented environment. Um, we have substantial resources. Uh, of course, there are challenges, right? The, the, this is a small government environment, small government state. There are minimal local, minimal state, and um, minimal county resources dedicated to ending the HIV epidemic in this part of the country, including in Texas. There's a lack of Medicaid expansion. That's a huge problem. There are state policies, obviously, that are counterproductive if your goal is to end HIV on sexual education, needle exchange, LBT, LGBTQ issues, structural racism, and the social safety net. There's problems across the board there. You don't need me to tell you that. There's limited local philanthropy. HIV is not out there in the same way among wealthy people. Uh, and so there's limited local philanthropy and that um, there's limited formal public health and local partnerships. One example of the, of the funding challenges is, is displayed on this slide. I looked at the publicly available information on Part A and Part B funding from Ryan White. These Part A and Part B dwarf Part C, Part D, Part F. They dwarf the EHE funding allocations. So this is going to represent the amount of money coming in. And you can see here two red states and two blue states two Medicaid expansion states compared to two non-Medicaid expansion states. The total numbers are go down, but if you, aver if you uh, 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 do it by person living with HIV, you can see it's fairly equal. Um, Florida and Texas are about the same as California and New York. But California and New York have expanded Medicaid, and Texas is not. And 36% of people uh, live in states that have not, with HIV, have li live in states that have not expanded Medicaid. And so California and New York, they don't have to worry about paying for ART. We do. They don't have to worry about paying for the primary care HIV provider. We do. And so we don't have the luxury of spreading those resources out to support services. Everyone here knows that, but I think these, if you're talking about equity, not equality, then I think this has to be addressed. And I recognize that the state and the government here is making those policies, but I'm not a policymaker. Do you punish the people making the bad policies? That, 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 I know. <laughs> well, I know I'm pretty sure I can guess where he stands. Do, do you, do you, what do you do at the federal level if you really want to end HIV? Are you silent on this? So um, to last slide, same uh, top half. So as a result of this environment here, I will say a couple things. One is the HIV epidemic is a little different. HIV tends to be more a disease of the poor here. Um, there are still substantial women uh, with HIV uh, and men who get HIV through heterosexual uh, sex, especially in our black and brown communities. And we don't want to make that mistake again and leave those populations behind as it when it comes to other problems uh, coming down the pipe. Um, but uh, importantly, because of these funding resources, we cannot implement some of the solutions that other areas can. We just can't, right? And that has to be factored in as we try to come up with policies or, or at least programs that can, we can use here in Texas and similar states. The other bu bullet point at the bottom is some things that we can implement are not considered innovative by the funding the sources, and so we don't get the funding to do it because it's not cutting edge in New York. You know, and that's fine. It's not cutting edge in New York, and maybe they don't need extra funding to implement it, but we still need it here because we, we don't have the money and the resources to do it. And we just need a lot. We need basic stuff that, doesn't, that might not be cutting edge there, we still need that. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And I Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, I want to say I appreciate you and all the work that you do. Um, 
data and research is not my thing, but we appreciate it because we do need that here and to show off to our elected officials so they can get a better look at the perspectives and, 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 and the, the, the research that we have to show them for what we need in our ass. Um, we're going to move on. We will take questions from the council. Um, we will do a Q&A. We will do a, a conversation between the panelists. But for the sake of time, we want to keep things moving and with our presentations, and then we'll come back to that. And so next, we're going to turn it over to um, State Representative um, Vincent Jones and Lindsay Langan. Yes, yes. yes. And, and, and while I'm here, while, b b before we give it to them, I just want to say um, three weeks ago, we had our primary elections. And I just want to say congratulations to you again for winning your primary yeah. and making it to the next round. So if you yeah. need to see you um, to there, yes. And so State Representative Jones and Lindsay Langan, Vice President of Government Relations and Public Affairs at Legacy Community Health Services, uh, will be presenting together on this next portion. Um, then again, we'll keep it moving and we'll come back for Q&A and so on and so forth. So I'll let you start it off and, and Lindsay, you guys go ahead and jump in. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you, uh, Demundry, and thank you uh, to Marlene and, and the members of the council uh, for our convening this very important conversation. Uh, again, my name is State Representative Vinton Jones. And I have the honor and privilege of serving as state representative for House District 100 in Dallas. And um, I've had a lot of uh, work around addressing uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic. I think most importantly in this space, um, I spent the first 20 years of my career uh, doing this very important work and it helped to inform uh, where I am right here and right now, uh, especially as a former member of the chat and mentee to many of you in the room. <laughs> so um, just again, thank you so much for continuing this very important conversation in the state of Texas in which um, from a national perspective, uh, we have definitely seen a lot of gains with the end of the epidemic initiative, um, but in places like Texas, uh, even though uh, definitely uh, as it relates to our last presentation, there are some successes, but there are still a lot of work uh, that needs to be done uh, when it comes to the meaningful involvement of people living with HIV, as well as uh, making sure that the systems and funding responsible uh, for ending this epidemic, whether that be by 2030, uh, which is not going to happen, uh, or uh, 2035, you know, as, as far as what we're, we're talking about. So very excited to have a conversation about uh, what happened in the 88th legislative session and also talk about some challenges. So to kick us off with our presentation, I'll turn it over to Lindsay. Thank you. And, and hopefully everyone in this room takes a page out of your book, which is that we all can be representatives. Um, it's so exciting to have someone like you in the state legislature. It's a dream come true for us that have worked on these policy issues for a very long time. So everyone run. OK, this, this, this is your call to action right now. Uh, so I work for Legacy Community Health. We are a uh, Ryan White Clinic. We actually started in the 80s. Um, uh, as the Montrose Clinic, we have about 7,000 individuals uh, living with HIV in our care, uh, but we're also a federally qualified health center. So I spend a lot of time on a, a lot of different issues, but I wanted to just point out the things that we did and we concentrated on this session, um, working with many of the state representatives in this room. Um, the first thing that we have done as, as legacy is try to organize not own um, the Texas HIV Day at the Capitol. So it's always been very important. This is owned by everyone. Um, so we, we called it the Texas HIV State Coalition. I think that, that was sort of an innocuous name so that no one entity had ownership um, over that program. And, but this year we tried something a little bit different. We um, worked with the Positive Women's Network, which if we can give them a hand, a round of applause. <laughs> can't say enough about the Positive Women's Network and specifically the strike force associated with it. Um, we had, a, we had a, a big funding issue before session even started um, that the strike force was activated on. And luckily, uh, we Legacy had our chair, the chair of the H Texas HIV medication program was from Legacy. So we were all able to work together and um, just an amazing group and very activated. So please join that if you uh, are anywhere across the nation, I think that uh, they, they get together for advocacy. Um, so we worked with Positive Women's Network PRISM, which is in Dallas, the North Dallas area. So amazing and SADI is now at, at AIDS United um, and then Legacy. Um, and the Broadway Cares was amazing. They've always helped us with an advocacy day um, to help and actually fund the buses that it takes, the food, the, you know, the shirts that need to be ordered. And so this is just a picture 
of almost all of the crowd, the, the crowd that stick, stuck around, but we did over a hundred people attended that day and we did over 50 legislative visits. And then I feel like Um, we also had a House resolution, and this year specifically, that was a big deal uh, because we've never seen this happen before in the state of Texas. I've been doing this for 16 years, where they were actually picking off um, things to not recognize. So the GLBT chamber, maybe the week before, was not recognized, and it's a huge slap in the face. I was so terrified that all 100 advocates that were there were going to, uh, I was crying the night before, I was up all night, um, but that did not happen. Um, and so we were so happy um, that that didn't happen. And I just wanna point out uh, Representative Jones, Representative Jones, the two Representative Jones in the room and how thankful we were that you rallied together. The picture behind you, it has a, a lot of different reps from all over the state. Um, and if you want to call out anyone else, you're more than welcome. But um, this was the first time we've been able to get HIV testing bills out of committee. And the first time, and, and this is led by <laughs> Representative Jones, the first time we've had testing bills pass out of the House. And so it was just a really good session. I'll show you that next. Okay, go ahead. Hey. Um, one, I just want to just acknowledge, you know, all of my colleagues, uh, definitely uh, Representative Jones uh, and everyone who, who made this happen. Uh, and this is important, um, especially as we talk about intersectionality and what was happening in the Texas House is that uh, with the elections of uh, myself, uh, Representative Jones, as well as Representative Christian Manuel up here, we were the first black LGBTQ people elected to the Texas House. And with, when it came to putting together legislation, um, we all were very intentional about making sure um, that we served black people, that we served uh, LGBTQ people, that we served the communities that sent us there uh, to be able to do this work. So um, not only the, the historic nature of the election, um, but actually being able to come in and move impactful legislation uh, was not a small feat. Uh, for th uh, three freshman uh, representatives uh, that were coming in to, to do this. So I just wanted to acknowledge definitely uh, Jolanda Jones, uh, Representative Jones, who her district is uh, less than a half a mile away as we deal with competing epidemics, both in Houston and in Dallas. So uh, thank you, Rep. Jones. Yes, agreed. <laughs> and we go way back. We, she was a city council member when I was at the city of Houston for six years. So I just adore, adore. Um, the, there were a couple of other things just to point out. So we actually had a joint author on this bill, a very conservative member of the Texas House. His name is Tom Oliverson. He is a physician um, and he's from sort of the outside of, of Houston area. And that was a big kicker in getting um, things, you know, through the house when he was up there um, supporting it it allowed a lot of other members um, from both parties to support as well. And then just to point out what DeAndre was saying, uh, Christian Manuel, he is a state rep in the <laughs> in Beaumont, but it's literally right next to the Speaker of the House. And so that those are very helpful things um, to have those, those two. Yeah. And then um, just to point out something that sort of happened unexpectedly, uh, Four years ago, we passed a bill to create sort of a protected class for HIV medications in the Medicaid program, meaning you can't um, ha mean pr you can't require prior prior authorization or to fail first on a medication. That bill passed, but it had um, a little bit of a it was it was set to expire in 2024. So we rolled in um, the extension, uh, and so now it is law and. Hopefully nothing happens with the Medicaid program um, that we have to step in on. And then I'll let uh, Representative Jones talk a little bit about the HIV testing bills. We have a fairly um, voluntary system here in Texas. The problem is, is that you go outside of Houston or Harris Health uh, and no one's testing. <laughs> and so we wanted to do as much as we possibly can to encourage and uh, almost require uh, that you test. Um, and so I'll let Representative Jones cover some of that. Absolutely. So when we're looking at uh, what are we going to do about HIV, 
uh, there was two bills that uh, continue to, to, come, uh, to come to the top uh, of the, the stack. Why? Uh, these were bills that were put forward before, but unfortunately never made it out of committee. And one of the biggest issues that um, I wanted to tackle, uh, also as a member of the Public Health Committee, uh, was routine HIV testing. And also uh, just the acknowledgement of um, the need for more screenings uh, for STIs and making sure um, that when someone goes into a healthcare provider uh, and asking for um, a panel of, H um, of STI screenings, uh, the HIV is included in um, that. Most people assume that that's happening, but I think that especially when we look at in the room, we look at you know, some of the providers that we have access to because of the work, um, that's not the story for everyone. And that's definitely something that is not happening to everyone. And so the first bill, uh, House Bill uh, 3377, uh, was to make sure that HIV is a part of um, STI screenings versus um, someone having to actually ask for an HIV test separately or assume that they were tested for HIV uh, if they went into a, a uh, healthcare uh, provider. Uh, to uh, House Bill 2235 um, is changing the opt-in testing environment uh, to an opt-out uh, testing environment. And so I'm very proud of these bills because not only um, did these bills make it unanimously uh, out of committee, um, they actually uh, were, was able to be voted off of the House floor. And the reason why these bills died in Senate was not necessarily any fault of the bills that uh, that was a result of the very public fighting um, that you're seeing in Texas between the governor, uh, lieutenant governor, and, and the speaker of the House. And this is very important. These bills are, are huge because um, they have bipartisan support um, throughout the entire time. And so people understood um, the challenges around routine HIV testing. There was even an, um, an example that was shared with me about a couple in Lubbock, Texas. Um, it was a white woman uh, who uh, was just becoming sick and ill all of the time. Um, they tried every test on her, um, but an HIV test over the years. And unfortunately, uh, she and her husband uh, passed and they ultimately found out that it was indeed HIV. But because um, she was living in rural Texas, because um, she was a, you know, a married woman, a, a senior, um, this didn't even come across the radar. And you know, that's one of the kind of extreme cases, but what happens in community uh, when people do not think um, that a person is at risk. I, I even recall my own story of uh, becoming HIV positive in which I literally went into an emergency room and said, I am a black gay man, I am sexually active, I am concerned about having HIV, in which I was told, um, you look healthy. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And, um, and, and, and literally had to continue to push until they actually gave me an HIV uh, test. So um, this bill was very important and, and also working to come into the house to change the hearts and minds of members of this, uh, of this body because one of the biggest things that we had to do, my team had to do in, in pushing this bill and also working uh, with, uh, with, with multiple organizations, uh, definitely I wanna shout out to uh, to Lindsay and the work that she did, uh, PRISM Healthcare in Dallas, and so many different partners to help educate members that HIV is still uh, very much so present. It is still something that we have to deal with. And oh, by the way, there is millions of dollars that are being poured in major cities uh, to end the HIV epidemic. Uh, so many people uh, did not know that, but that information was definitely key in uh, the success of these two pieces of legislation. And um, we're definitely going to be uh, pushing both of these bills in the 89th session. And if I'm a big picture person, I'm a visual learner. So I wanted y'all to see the board. That's the vote board. So that's Republicans and Democrats. I've never seen an HIV bill on a, on a board before. And it's just so exciting. I think we both cried that night. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, just the amount he did um, and working just, just by members knowing him um, because he's just a wonderful person to know. So just know he's been working really hard to make sure that we get bipartisan support. So thank you. <laughs> I just love you. There were a couple, couple of other bills. Um, there's always a syringe exchange bill every year. Um, it didn't make it out of committee this year. Um, and then you have your criminal repeal bill. Do you wanna talk at sure. all about that? Sure. So this was once again, another bill that has been um, heard in every legislative session since 1984 in Texas. Um, as far as to, to repeal um, language, um, 
that, you know, that makes um, homosexual conduct a criminal offense. We already know from the Supreme Court in 20, uh, 2003 um, that is unconstitutional. However, um, this, bill, uh, this law still remained in the Texas books. And um, we are actually even seeing from Republicans up and inclusive of uh, Ted Cruz, which is the only time I say his name in a positive way. But, um, but uh, Ted Cruz, who actually really, um, who said that this bill does not need to be on the books. Many Republicans agreed this bill does not need to be on the books. And so again, this was a bill that many people thought during the 88th legislative session would go nowhere. Um, and I actually had colleagues that told me not to do this bill. Um, but it did go somewhere. It, again, for the first time, uh, got out of committee unanimously. Uh, it actually got, uh, we actually worked to get it to the House floor, um, but this bill ran out of time and actually competed with another um, major bill that Republicans wanted um, to um, make uh, gender affirming care harder for, um, for our transgender youth and their families. And so um, this is still something that moved the needle forward. But again, there's still so much work when we're still having conversations about removing unconstitutional language uh, from our Texas code. And we saw with the opposition that happened with this bill that there's still an issue, of course, in Texas of acknowledging the dignity and humanity of LGBTQ people and, dare I say, people of color and also people living with HIV. And so there's still a lot of work to be done, but uh, super proud that this bill, for the first time, uh, was able to get a calendar um, appointment to be heard on the floor. And next time, we're going to ha have it heard on the floor and get this passed. And then just know, last, you also did um, sort of a decrim, a decrim bill as well. Um, that's always a priority in Texas. I, I will say last session, not this last one, but the one before that, we had a big scare with a very large, well-known member who filed a bill um, around uh, if you knowingly are an individual living with HIV and you transmit, it was, it, it was, I guess, part of the penal code. And luckily the strike force again activated and man, I, I did not think they expected seven people to show up and testify against that bill. So just know that last session, two sessions ago, um, that was defeated. Right, me too, <laughs> my memory. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about PREB and, and uh, your efforts in that area as well. And so this is a bill uh, where we worked uh, with uh, State Representative uh, Julie Johnson um, to uh, make sure that uh, not only for people living with HIV, but uh, any individuals who are um, living with an immunocompromised uh, condition uh, can be able to access health care benefits. It's already mentioned um, how critical and how problematic uh, disruptions in care are. And when it comes to these medications before the passing of this bill, uh, which actually, um, is this one? Actually, oh no, there's actually, this is actually not the one. And so let me actually come back to that one. Um, I guess I didn't have it. That's okay. Uh, so let me, let me check. So this was the initial bill um, that was uh, removing uh, PrEP as far as a, um, a, a condition or, or a medication that you have to get preauthorized. We end up not following this bill to support the bill that actually passed, which was a, what another member had, Julie Johnson, which PrEP would have been included, PrEP was included in this, that uh, even though this bill passed, there was a bill that passed that says now, instead of preauthorization every time, that preauthorization time went to annually. So a person doesn't have to do it every time they get a medication refill, that it just has to happen and, and be re, uh, reauthorized on an annual basis. And what we just had to look at was the calculus of being able to try to push two bills that were doing similar things or being able to work together uh, with another member to, to pass that. So uh, we're very happy that um, the bill that did pass also included PrEP um, to not necessarily remove it as not needing preauthorization at all, but really did move the needle forward and change that to an annual basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a huge bill. You're right. Um, okay. And then just interim issues, kind of what we're looking at right now. Um, 14 million is what the state is saying they need to put HIMV uh, injectables on the Texas HIV medication program. 
Um, there's some debate about whether or not 14 million is actually the number. There was an, a line item in the budget, um, but I know many of you in this room are probably working on that as well. It needs to be an option for individuals um, on the THMP. This is a very vulnerable population um, financially, and so we have to make sure that they're given the best medical care for us possible. So something we're working on in the interim. Another thing is the, the adult safety net. Um, the state uh, talking about vaccines in Texas is very fun, if, if you can imagine. Um, and so some of the really, really important vaccines um, for the immunosuppressed were taken off of the adult safety net. And so we are working to get that put back on and get them a budget. And then just in general, um, 41 states purchase insurance uh, with their HIV medication programs or ADAP funds. We do not do that in Texas, and we need to do that. It saves money. It gives you better care. There's no reason we shouldn't be doing this. Florida does it. Georgia does it. Let's do it. Um, so that's always something that I'm pushing for as well. So let's see if there's anything else. So, and so I think we're going we're gonna to hold off on the questions. We, we might have had a couple. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. We were, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Are we going to turn around to see? We're going to go back to it. She was going to Yeah, you better take questions. Okay. Yep. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rep. Jones. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate you. Um, I'm excited to come back and do Q&A and questions around this, especially around Texas politics and so on and so forth. A lot of things that you guys said struck a chord with me as well, especially when it comes to testing. And so to see you guys pushing so hard to making those requirements and so on is really, um, it's, it's inspiring. Um, we're going to keep going. We're going to let uh, Ms. Sophia jump in and, and give a quick um, overview of the work that they're doing at Equality Texas. And then we're going to take a break. Um, I know we're kind of over time, but we're going to let you guys take a break and then we'll come back and do our Q&A, okay? Um, so next up we have Ms. Sophia. S help me with the... Sepulveda. Sepulveda. Sepulveda, okay. From, <laughs> from the field director of Equality Texas, um, can you please just jump in and talk a little bit about the work that you guys are doing and that you've been a part of, um, so forth. And I know we don't have a, a slide, so that's okay. So we'll No, thank you, DeAndre, yes, for the introduction. And um, yes, unfortunately, I didn't prepare slides today. Um, I just got information about this uh, meeting uh, literally last week. So um, we are the leading LGBTQIA advocacy organization in Texas. We literally were, were the ones who were bringing hundreds and hundreds of people to the Capitol this last legislative session to stop all of this horrendous bill that they were trying to push against our community. 114 of them, no, 141 of them actually, they were done against our community. And not just the, the LGBT community, the community as a whole, like DEI bills, which affects also the black and Latina community as well as indigenous community. So we were able to defeat 134 out of 141 bills. Um, and we brought around 700 people for our LGBTQ advocacy day. Unfortunately, we, uh, we didn't focus as much on the HIV advocacy days because we were Focus on really ending the bill that they were targeting our community, which I think we were successful at. However, please let me know what else we can do for the next session so we can show up with those 700 people to push for better bills that are supporting our community. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a uh, transgender woman who has been living with HIV since I was 25 years old, right? And as it's literally, this is super important to me, right? Um, uh, I've been working also the, with the Metro Health in San Antonio, which is our local healthcare uh, uh, organization in San Antonio, who are pushing, who is pushing for ending the HIV epidemic. But as I was talking to uh, to Lindsay earlier, we cannot end the HIV epidemic when the uh, when the government, when our government is hostile to our community, particularly the LGBT community, the Latino community, the Black community, the immigrant community, who are the the, the most affected communities. Right. We um, we also got engaged with the Texas HIV Syndicate. I'm working on the End the Stigma group, and we do have some uh, goals by September 30, 24, which is complete environmental scan of HIV stigma activities around the state. Um, this uh, by December 31st, 2024, share information collected from the environmental scan and goal two by December 31, 24, execute, execute method to collect stigma data throughout the state. And uh, again, we cannot end the HIV epidemic when we continue oppressing our communities, right? We cannot, uh, if 
I, like we have the cities in Houston, Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio, who are part of the fast track cities, who are um, really putting a lot of effort, a lot of local money, because our our, our state government literally on their website has has a clause that says the state of Texas does not provide money for HIV uh, uh, research or medication. It has to come from the Ryan White program. So if we don't have the Ryan White program in Texas, we don't have HIV medication in Texas, just so you know, right? Which is super, super horrible, especially for us people who live with HIV. And, and um, I, was I was listening to Jesse Milan earlier when he was talking about um, transferring from individual insurance to Medicaid and literally I just freaked out, right? Because we don't have any plans as to how we're gonna pay for these medications when it comes to Medicaid. I mean, med uh, when it comes to um, Medicaid, in, uh, Medicare, hold on. Medicaid in Texas, no, Medicaid in Texas, which is given by, by, by the state government, we also have a lot of barriers, right? Not only barriers for HIV medications, but areas now for, H, uh, for gender affirming care medications. In fact, the, um, the Health and Human Services of Texas just passed a clause that denies HIV, um, gender affirming care medication to everyone, not just children who are trans kids, but also adults. So we need to continue to start looking as to where we can include ourselves in order to continue our work and ensure that our people in Texas are protected because right now we are not protected, right? It doesn't matter how many, literally during the legislative session, when we were here in HB 1686, which is gender affirming care ban for children, we showed up with over 2000 people to testify against this bill. They didn't let us testify. Only 20 people testify majority from out of state who were supportive of that, of that bill. So again, denying Texas the chance to speak up when it comes to our own community from our government, right? I, 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 I don't know what else to say except for uh, the amazing work that a Baylor University is doing alongside with, with San Antonio and, and our representatives are doing to ensure not only protections for the LGBT community, but protections for people who, who are living with HIV. And I just wanna add um, my appreciation to Equality of Texas because um, sometimes, you know, we kind of get caught up in making our, you know, ceremonial one visit to the Capitol and thinking that's enough. Equality Texas showed up and partners showed up daily um, because when it was time for the committee to meet, again, there was over 2,000 people, the most that we've ever had in a committee um, that, was, that were signing up um, to oppose this bill. And they stayed not just during the committee, meet, uh, not just during the day, but actually stayed from 8 a.m. that morning to, over, to after midnight. Um, advocating uh, for, uh, for um, this bill not to be passed. And, and even then, uh, leadership continued to push uh, this bill through. So even as it came down to the House floor and we had to work to kill this bill, not once, not twice, but three times to kill this bill, and it kept coming back. And also, you know, partners like Equality Texas kept coming back uh, to continue to fight that bill. So even though that bill passed, um, my hat's off uh, to... Uh, the organizers at Equality Texas uh, to you uh, for for c continuing to come back because that is so important because that's exactly what happens. Um, so many wait till, till we leave and then just continue to move those things through and they didn't have that. And so I'm so proud to 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 have stood you know beside Equality Texas as this fight you know took place in the 88th session. Awesome. If I may say the last thing, yes. right? Like, I, thank you for, for acknowledging that. We were there literally, yes, every day until they literally kick us out. It was, I got banned for a year from going to the Capitol for dropping a banner. Oh. Just so you know how hostile it was. Then the next day, literally the people from Uvalde dropped another banner and they were okay. I was banned for dropping a banner that just said, let trans kids grow up. That's how hostile the environment is in Texas, right? It, I, going after a population that literally is only 120,000 people in Texas, less than 1%, less than 1%. While we're still suffering from a bad infrastructure, we still are suffering from bad winters where people still die. We're still suffering from bad uh, 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 heat in the summer where people still die. Right, we don't have Medicaid expansion like uh, Representative Jones was saying. 
we don't have a, a, a minimum wage. We don't have the, the opportunity to have a ballot measure because that was taken away from us in Texas, right? So we don't have a, a lot. Our, our hands are tied when it comes to working with HIV and LGBTQ issues. We need help from the federal government and we need the, the help coming from the, not just to the state, but to the cities who are actually doing the work. It's enough given to the state who are not giving back to us. We need to have this money going directly to the people who are working directly with the people and community in order to ensure that we are really working to end the epidemic. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Look, we're going to take a, a five minute break. My alarm is set for four minutes and 30 seconds. So we're going to sit back down around that time when y'all hear this alarm go off. So as of right now, everybody go ahead, use the restrooms, get your water and everything and come right back here in five minutes. Thank you. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.